The following is a Barrett Sports Media production. Every sports media star has a story. From the highs... We are number one. We just grabbed every key demographic. (laughs) To the lows. You're fired! The path to success is always different. To help you learn more about the industry's top broadcasters, Barrett Sports Media brings you the Sports Talkers Podcast. Now, here's your host, Stephen Strom. And thank you for making us a part of your morning, afternoon, night sports talkers podcast. Steven Strom here, BarrettSportsMedia.com. We've got a good one for you today. It's Freddie Coleman of ESPN. He is the co-host of the weeknight ESPN radio show, Freddie and Fitzsimmons. We talk a little bit about his childhood, how he broke into sports radio, some on-air mistakes and how to handle them. And we talk about one that he had recently with Justin Thomas and JT Poston. Uh, We also just talk about what's kept him at ESPN, and Freddie is just, when you talk about humility, saw the earth kind of guys, uh, Freddie is one of them. We also talk about the talent at ESPN, who's got next, and uh, what was like working with Chris Mad Dog Russo, someone he grew up uh, listening to in New York. He was on with First Take with him over the summer, so we talk about that experience with him. So overall, fun conversation with Freddie Coleman just ahead. And as always, make sure to rate, subscribe, and review the Sports Talkers podcast. Check out the site, BarrettSportsMedia.com. We've got podcasts. We've got articles. JB has you covered. Without further ado, here is Freddie Coleman. Give me a sense of your childhood and, and when you started to – uh, get this idea or passion for sports radio? Well, I'll tell you what, growing up, there was no sports talk radio, Stephen, because I didn't have the advantages that a lot of younger people have now where you not only have local shows, but you have national shows. And there weren't even any sports kind of talk shows on TV. There weren't any kind of debate first take kind of shows that was going on. But it, I've always been a sports fan. I love that from the jump. I can clearly clearly remember the first time watching a football game or watching a basketball game and just loving everything about athletics but the first time I got any kind of any kind of being about sports talk radio was in New York where Art Rush Jr. he did a sports show every night in WABC in the late 70s and I thought it was fantastic somebody gave him a platform each and every night to talk about sports on radio because nobody was doing that Mm. other than being part of a morning show or a news show and doing updates. And he's a pioneer that a lot of people should know more about when it comes to Art Rush Jr., what he was able to do. And he could talk anything, baseball, basketball, football, you name it. So I stand on the shoulders of somebody like that, that before WFAN got started about nine years later, he was the first one to do a show like that on a night-by-night basis on WABC in New York. So you were a New Yorker. Where did you grow up in New York? In Brooklyn, New York, born in Do or Die Bed Stuy on Hancock Street at St. Mary's Hospital. And then my mom and dad, they moved to Bushwick on Schaefer Street. And then they moved to Queens when I got a little older, becoming a teenager. But I'm BK all day, every day. Love that. Your biceps are are, are punching through your shirt. Were you an athlete <laughs> yeah. uh, when, when growing up? Oh, yeah. I played a whole bunch of sports and I wound up playing football in college at Mansfield University, where I graduated in Pennsylvania. From- absolutely in Pennsylvania in the Pennsylvania State Athletic Conference but it was really cool growing up in New York because even though we didn't have green grass and the plains like they do in other areas we were able to really have what we wanted in terms of going to play basketball in the Mm. park or touch football in the streets or stick ball so that's where my love of sports really deepened and that passion was really there. All right so you get to college you're playing college football what's the career status for Freddie Coleman at this point? Boy, I I wanted to be the next great rock and roll DJ because I grew up as a music head in New York where I had a chance to listen to WBLS and Disco 92 with Roscoe and those guys and then classic rock on WNEW with Scott Muni and all those great DJs. And I wanted to be that next great FM jock. I want to be that one that people talked about great radio personalities and DJs and music. That's where. So it wasn't even necessarily sports. It was more music. Oh, absolutely. I mean, my first job I ever had, Stephen, was in music radio back in 1988, working in Portland, Maine. And FAN had just gotten started barely six months before I got my first job in this business. So I had no designs on sports talk radio. Loved the format, loved everything about it. But I was really a music head and still am a music head. Okay, so now let's fast forward to your first opportunity in sports radio. Where was it and what were you doing? Working up in Albany, New York, that's where I really got a taste having a full-time job back in 2004, part of Tobin and Coleman 
in Albany, New York, in the Fox Sports affiliate. But I had a chance to do that a couple of times, filling in when I was still working in the Hudson Valley in Poughkeepsie, New York, and filling in on shows and doing guest updates with friends of mine who had shows in that market and having a chance to fill in for them when they went on vacation. So I thought that was something that I could possibly do. You didn't know where that road was going to lead. But that's where that really got started, having a chance to fill in about 2002, 2003, mm-hmm. before we full-blown, full-time position in 2004. What did you feel like you had at a broadcast level or what you did specifically that maybe others didn't that gave you the belief that you can get to this point in your career? Boy, Stephen, that's a really good question. The honest answer is that I felt I was I wasn't concerned about trying to be the second somebody else or the third somebody else. I felt that if I could be the first Freddie Coleman and what that was going to entail, then that was going to work for me. And the one thing that I know I was going to have as much as anybody else was a passion for the subject. I always love having my mind always working and working and finding out information and finding out storylines and digging deep beyond the box score. So that was something that I believe was going to carry me. And whatever I could do to accent my talent or accent my ability, that was going to be my baseline, having a passion of finding out exactly what went on to what we got the final result, no matter Mm -hmm. what that was or who that was. So you've been at ESPN for quite some time. What's kept you there so long? I'm blessed to love what I do and do what I love. And I keep telling people, even a bad day at ESPN Radio is better than a good day for anybody else because we have a blast what we do. And we know how fluid situations can be in our business where you could be on top or near the top one second and then the next second nobody is paying attention to you. you got to be able to manage those and balance those waves and those peaks and valleys that are going to happen. So I'm really, really blessed. I get a chance to still do something, and it's still a blast each and every time I open up the microphone and have my big mouth out there making my thoughts. And <laughs> uh, Freddie, th- there's a there's a funny thing on YouTube about uh, you having an interview with your thinking JT Justin Thomas, and it ends up being JT Poston. Uh, how do you, as a broadcaster, handle that situation? And what's going through your mind, I guess, after you realize that it's not Justin Thomas? Don't be afraid to laugh at yourself and laugh at your flubs because there's never been a perfect broadcaster. No matter how great our heroes and heroines have been, they had their moments where they had a less than opportune, less than opportune situation to be the best or have the best come out. So I was going to handle that with humor. And I'm really glad that JT had a sense of humor as well because I'm sure – it's not the only time that he's been confused with Justin Thomas, not trying to condone or try to make an excuse for that. But I'm really glad that somebody on the other side of that was having fun with it. And then we're able to continue the interview and go from there. But I wasn't afraid to laugh at myself for making that kind of mistake. And that's the kind of mistake, Stephen, you don't want to make. But when it happens, don't let it break you. Don't let it bring you down. Just acknowledge it was a mistake. Have a fun with it. Acknowledge the flub and move on to what's important. That is getting the best out of that interviewer that you're going to do. Now we talked about the ups and downs of being in this business and we don't even we haven't really highlighted even the cutthroat aspect of things but you know through any job through any network and where you're at you have guys that you lean on or gals that you lean on who has been or who have they been for you at ESPN Oh my goodness my first broadcast partner John Seibel we still talk to this day and have conversations back and forth and even though we haven't worked together in a long long time he was somebody I really really relied on and leaned on it learned so much about how to manage things and how to navigate things. Same thing with Chuck Wilson. Chuck Wilson, who had a chance to be part of the game night crew when it was me and him, and John Seibel and Doug Gottlieb and Jeff Rickard and Amy Lawrence were filling on time to time as well. It was really a good group of people that we had a chance to work with. So I always leaned on him because he was such an ambassador of how to do a show and how to do it properly and how to manage a show and how to make it entertaining. And definitely Jason Barrett because Jason Barrett was instrumental. Mm. With me, all right, now he does a great job at sports media. I still rely on him from advice from time to time because he's so knowledgeable and he's been through so many different situations and so many different people to be around that has informed what he's been able to do and make him very, very terrific and very, very good at what he does. So you were able to fill in on first take uh, in the summer and uh, cool moment, I think, for you because you're from New York and you got to do it with Chris Mad Dog Russo. I interned mm-hmm. for Chris Mad Dog Russo. I wow. grew up on Mike and the Mad Dog on Yes Network. That's how I pretty much got into this. My dad and I used to listen. What was that moment like for you? And you know, I try to explain to people, they ask me, what's Chris like? What's working with Chris like? 
I tell you what, he's just a great ball of energy and he's a great ball of knowledge. And I know a lot of people, they hear the blast, they hear the bravado because that's who he is when he gets very passionate about something. And when the dog is on that bone, he's not letting it go. But you couldn't find a more quality person. I always tell people anytime you meet somebody like that who's a terrific broadcaster, and in his case, a Hall of Fame broadcaster, but Stephen, he's an, an even better person. And it was really cool sitting down and talking with him before we go on first take. And I said to myself, man, how did I get here? Well, I'm about to be across the <laughs> table from Chris Russo, one of my sports talk radio heroes, but somebody that anytime I was in New York, I automatically flipped on Mike and the Mad Dog and nothing against Mike Francesa, but I flipped it on for Chris Mad Dog Russo because I knew I was going to be entertained and I knew that he was going to say something that I was going to agree with or not agree with, but I knew it was always going to be something that was going to make me think what he had to say and how he felt. So that was pretty cool being across the table from him mm. and not trying to be him, but being in that orbit and finding my way and then having a friendship develop is something that I always cherish because those kind of things can happen, but you never know when they're going to happen in our business. is always so fluid. A couple more left. Freddie Coleman with us now. Let's stick on that topic with, Mike and the Mad Dog, because anyone that really listens to this is going to know about those two. Why do you think Chris is able to have this like second blossom career? We know he's a Hall of Fame broadcaster, but now this new first take has given him an even bigger platform. And then we look at Mike Francesa, no disrespect to him, but he's not in that, I guess, circuit right now. He's doing a podcast. But why do you think Chris has been able to have this second uh, surge in his career as Mike really kind of has not Because he wasn't afraid to go and be himself and take a chance on a network on Sirius XM because it could have been very easy for him to stay comfortable because when you're in that kind of time slot in New York City, you literally can write your own ticket and have statues named after you and school dedicated schools dedicated to you because there was no reason for him to break out of that. But he felt that he could do something different and really make himself not so much bigger, but better. And he's been better, in my opinion, once he broke away from Mike Francesa. And that's not trying to demean or belittle what they did, because what they did was incendiary and was really seminal in how they made that work with WFAN. When Now you think of WFAN, immediately, those are the two names you first made up. Yep. And, and you're going to think about that 500 years from now. Talk about the history of WFAN. You're going to think about Chris Russo and Mike Francesa. But he was unafraid to go out there and say, OK, I know I can have a chance to make this work on this platform. Mm believe in me i believe in myself and by him doing that and able to expand that now he's doing mlb network when he does that because I, of, uh, first takes all he brought to the table he's on every wednesday and that's must see tv with him and Stephen a smith by having that faith and trust in his abilities because i'm sure Stephen, that had to be very scary to do that so but scary he, yeah but he believed in himself to say i'm going to make this work and i got enough people behind me that believe in me that we're not going to fail no matter what the end result is going to be I think you're right on the money, Freddie. We got two more left for you. Who's got next at ESPN? When you look around at some of the young town, there's a plethora of it. Who do you look at and you're like, this person's really good and really young, and they're going to be at the top uh, of this network very soon? Oh, well, I'm definitely on. There's so many different people you can say that about. I mean, I think Randy Scott's terrific on Sports Center, for example. I think he's tremendous. I can't say L. Duncan's going to get to the top because she's already there, but she does so many different things and so many different platforms. On the radio side, people that have been able to work with filling in with Ian Fitzsimmons, I think Hugh Myers is really, really good, really a talented guy, runs the ESPN affiliate out in Las Vegas. He has a lot of passion, a lot of energy. It's always cool working with him. I think he's going to be something. I love what Amber Wilson has been able to do. And I, uh, Amber Down Wilson, here. Yeah, yeah Amber him. Wilson, Courtney Cronin. And now Amber has done a great job with Joe and Amber getting that started. I really love her ability. I love the way she thinks from a lawyer's perspective, but she also is not afraid to let you know that I'm not just a girl that loves sports. I'm a woman that knows sports. So she's really, really terrific. I love that. I think her star is only going to continue to rise at ESPN and not just on the radio side. So there are plenty of talented people on all in all different facets, but mm -hmm. those are the names that jump to mind immediately that I think they're only going to continue to get bigger and bigger. Freddie, you're such a humble guy, but I'm going to put you on the spot here because you can also uh, you can also talk about yourself in a positive way on this podcast. You know, I hope you're on the air for another 50 years, but when it's all said and done with your career and you get someone on the street say, hey, you know, did you listen to Freddie Coleman? Yeah, yeah. Tell me a little bit about Freddie. What was his show like? What was he like? What do you want people to say about you? The one thing I want people to say is that as much fun as you thought I was having, I was having that time 100 because I always tell people 
there's no place that I would rather be than what I'm doing at that moment. And whether it's doing my show with Ian Fitzsimmons Monday through Friday from 9 p to 1 a.m. Eastern time or having a chance to fill in on first take or KJM or other earlier shows. I don't want people to ever listen to me and say he's going through the motions or that he didn't want to be there or he really doesn't enjoy his job. People know that that enjoyment comes through because it comes from my soul. It comes from my heart and it comes out of my mouth and it comes out of my head. So you may not agree with what I have to say. Hell, you may not like what I have to say. You may not even like me, but you're never going to question where that passion is coming from, where that fun is coming from, because those are always going to be front and center in any show I'm going to do to make sure that everybody gets the best Freddie Coleman night by night. And a big shout out to Freddie for joining us today. Busy man. He's do his, he does his weeknights on ESPN Radio. He's filling in for Keyshawn, Jay, and Max. So he's a busy guy. I'm really appreciative of his time and appreciate you guys for always tuning in. We're back here next Thursday on the Sports Talkers podcast. Enjoy the rest of your weekend, and we will talk to you next week right here on BarrettSportsMedia.com. Thank you for listening to the Sports Talkers podcast with Stephen Strong. A reminder that each episode can be found on iTunes, Spotify, and most podcasting platforms. To stay up to date on future episodes, visit BarrettSportsMedia.com.